When Westerners are confronted with the blunt facts of global poverty, it becomes immediately apparent that most of the material things they pray for are more driven by greed than by need. Greed makes us want more than we can handle. It makes us heap up things until we have to acquire more living space just to keep it all. Greed is the spirit that drives corporate America. It's why corporate downsizing has become so popular while top-level executives earn ridiculously exorbitant bonuses. Greed is pervasive within the Western culture, and the church is not immune to its vices. We seem to have forgotten that God only promised to meet our needs, not to satiate our greed. The sad reality is that greed is vigorously promoted from the pulpit and by those who are supposed to be the pillar of truth and justice in society. My intention here is to sound the alarm and awaken the conscience of people in order to see injustice come to an end. It is not an attempt to judge anyone. Rather, it is an attempt to incite awareness in the hopes that we would work to reform our unequal world. If we have problems using this absolute definition of poverty, we can also look at poverty as a relative idea. That is, we can see poverty as something socially defined, or something that depends on a particular social context. Such a relative measurement would ask us to compare, for example, the total wealth of a segment of the poorest people in the world with the total wealth of a segment of the richest people in the world. If we do that, these comparisons will be even more bleak and unsettling. A recent study published by a senior World Bank economist showed that the richest 50 million people in Europe and North America have roughly the same income as almost 3 billion per people collected from around the world. This 1% of the world's population takes as large a piece of the pie as the small slice handed to the world's poorest 57% of people. Using another illustration, if we use the poverty line as defined by the countries of North America and Western Europe, then the poorest 10% of Americans are better off than a full two-thirds of the world's entire population. The World Bank recently reported that 24 developing countries with a population of 3 billion people are beginning to integrate into the global economy, with a per capita growth of only 1% in the 1960s up to 5% in the 1990s. Even so, the state of world economics and the ratios of poverty between the Western world and the developing world are very dramatic. It is no secret that there is inequality among nations. Certain countries of the world have most of the money while others have very little. There is also inequality within nations, for it is a fact that within poor countries there are rich groups of people whose incomes compare to the incomes of wealthy groups in the more developed nations. Our sense of goodness and fairness suggests a more equitable distribution of the income of the world. Our sense of fairness and rightness says that within a country, some should not be living in mansions while others scrounge around for food in garbage dumps. It is hard to understand why distribution of wealth is so unequal. Our sense of what is just and appropriate cries out and asks why. Reasons for inequalities Why do some countries have so much and others so little? One explanation is that this situation is a result of the market economy. Rich countries are rich because they supply things that are scarce but in high demand. Poor nations are poor because they supply too many things for which there is relatively little demand. This explanation, however, seems somewhat simplistic and does not answer the question of poverty in poor nations such as South Africa, which supplies the world with diamonds, and Nigeria, which is the world's ninth largest producer and supplier of oil, both commodities that are very much in demand. Whatever the answer might be, it is clear that inequalities in the world cry out for some form of remedy. As President George W. Bush said at a meeting of the Inter-American Development Bank, a world where some live in comfort and plenty, while half of the human race lives on less than $2 a day, is neither just nor stable. One way the world attempts to come to grips with poverty on an international scale is through the concept of foreign aid. This is where poor nations receive money to encourage their growth and economic development. Reasonably rich nations donate money to alleviate the conditions of poverty in poor nations. This is especially true when richer countries tout their moral responsibility by pointing to the size of their foreign aid budget. Despite the fact that there seems to be no objective evidence to prove foreign aid stimulates economic development in poor countries, the rich nations continue pledging more money and aid to the world's less developed nations. The reality of poverty is that one-third of deaths, 
some 18 million people each year, are due to poverty-related causes. That is 300 million people since 1990, the majority women, roughly equal to the population of the United States. Every year nearly 11 million children die before their fifth birthday. These are horrible, sobering facts. Can the Christian Church do anything to solve the problem of worldwide poverty and the inequality of wealth distribution? Aside from foreign aid and the economic theories of supply and demand, is there a spiritual dimension to poverty? The follow ING chapters do not discount economics, but they go beyond the economic sphere to blend the laws of economics and spirituality and to address the individual hearts of men and women as they submit to God in their quest to overcome poverty. This book is not a study of world poverty or economics, but it does seek to answer the question, is the Christian and the Christian church relevant to the eradication of poverty in the world today? I wish to address Christians who have access to biblical solutions to this problem, and I want to tell you my thesis right up front. Christians around the world must become kingdom-minded in order for us to help resolve the problem of poverty in our world today. The purpose of the church is not to have people come in and sit down. Rather, it is to go out and change cultures by establishing God's value system. Moreover, this includes God's value system regarding money and wealth. Poverty is not God's will for anyone, and it is outside kingdom purposes for Christians to be struggling in the area of finances, whether personal or societal. Being kingdom-minded is what the Apostle Paul calls being transformed by the renewing of your mind. I have stated in other videos about applying the principles of the kingdom to the church, and now I want to apply those same principles to individual Christians on questions of money, wealth, and personal finances. Remember, God's kingdom principles apply to money as much as they do to anything else. World poverty is agonizingly real. It will never improve until individual Christians affect the culture of life, change the culture of nations, and improve their own financial situations. Thus, the economic growth of the world must be the priority of individuals in obedience to the teaching of Scripture and the principles of the Kingdom of God. Hence, the reason why a Christian desires financial freedom is not just to meet his or her needs but also to become an answer to the challenges of our world. The Great Commission of Matthew 28 verses 19 to 20 is not only about rescuing souls and planting churches. It is about much more. The Great Commission tells us to make disciples of all nations. Nations are cultures, and cultures are to be transformed and redeemed by Christ's church taking dominion over God's entire creation here on earth. The purpose of the Great Commission is to change cultures, and this means the church needs a new model or style of missions. God is not satisfied with our church-minded approach. He created everything, and He wants His principles to rule everywhere. That is our assignment in the Great Commission to permeate the world with the nature and principles of God and to be the Lord's representative in our spheres of influence. If we are in a place, then God is there. Only the redeemed can improve our world. That is why God is calling Christians all over the world to take up the challenge of conquering the mountain of finances to subdue the earth for God.